Welcome to the GM on MNG video podcast. We are not good at coming up with names, but Gordy and I are here today to talk about the Flames, the Heat, prospects, the NHL trade deadline, and kind of just whatever we feel like as we uh, take a shot on the on podcasting on YouTube a little bit. We've done a few others with Matchsticks and Gasoline. We have the Tinderbox. I also have one with Mark from Matchsticks, uh, Mark and Michael's Musings, and... Uh, yeah, no, we thought we'd give this a shot and uh, perhaps do a little more focus on the younger players, the prospects, and yeah. So, Gordy, how are you doing today? I'm good, and yeah, like we're we're both Calgarians. We're both kind of prospect nerds, draft nerds. We like all the kind of nitty gritty deals and the small stuff that we know a lot of you guys like as well. So we figured we kind of do a little podcast here where we kind of go more into depth on that stuff. We can, you know, t- touch on Calgary events lots of good sports around here and yeah like I think today we're going to start off with just talking about a couple really good heat prospects who I mean at this point we're talking about NHL debuts and NHL call-ups but the Flames are in a situation where they're a top team in the NHL and at this point the roster's more or less set so yeah Mike if you had any thoughts you wanted to go yeah go for it. Yeah, I guess the first thing I kind of wanted to get into today, and I actually kind of threw this out on our Twitter page, is like, it kind of seems like we're pretty set in that Sean Monaghan's going to be the fourth center going into the playoffs. Like, he's just kind of in that role now. Um, I thought it was interesting yesterday, Daryl Sutter was talking about Adam Rizicia. They were kind of talking about how he hasn't really had that steady spot in the lineup. Like, he's kind of had games where he's been good and games where he's been not so good, and that's kind of been a harp on him all the way back to his junior days. Like, I don't know, I asked the people on Twitter, like, if we if playoffs come around, like if the season ended today, like are you comfortable with Ruzicka kind of being that third center on the flames or would you kind of prefer a situation with maybe they where maybe they like send him back down to Stockton and get him a run there and the flames bring someone else. And I just kind of want to know where you stand on that. Yeah. Like I look at the flames a lot and it seems like a lot of the like changes are around the wingers and where wingers should play and stuff. But like, yeah, the the depth down the center and their center icemen have really kind of caught my attention recently. And, like, we talk, talk about Ruzicka in that third spot, but, like, is Backland, are you comfortable with Backland really as a number two center? Because, I mean, yes, there, he's a good shutdown center, and I think he can play that role well. But as he's gotten older, his finishing ability and his scoring ability is, it's a real hindrance on his game, I think. He's... He misses a lot of chances despite the chances he generates. And, I mean, with Blake Coleman and Trevor Lewis, that's not really a second line, even if that's where it's at. So, I mean, we're almost talking about Ruzicka as the second line center. And personally, I think he's looked good with Mangiapane and Toffoli. I mean, they'll need some more time together. And, I mean, Sutter does switch those lines up. So, we'll see, you know, how much they get uh, playing with each other. But other than that, like... Ruzichka has been fine for me. I really see him as kind of a younger Monaghan and the way he looks out there, the way he plays. He's kind of like a tall, lanky skater, but not really very physical. His One of his bigger assets is definitely a shot, which was, you know, Monaghan's calling card earlier in his career. But, I mean, Monaghan is, I, I feel really bad for him. Those la- these last few games, it feels like he's been throwing the body and throwing checks, like, by necessity almost to to kind of prove that he's he can stay in the lineup because we've watched him for what eight years now and you know physicality is not part of Sean Monaghan's game (laughs) yeah totally I think with with Monaghan you it's probably just a player who I mean they all know the business and everything he probably knows that if the Flames are looking at making a big ad he's probably the name that could be going the other way just with his big cap it with where he's fallen down the lineup like I, I I think like you said we're just seeing a guy who's kind of have to pull out stops that he's not used to pulling and um I don't know personally I'd like to see him stick around I don't think it's a necessity to trade him unless you need to do it strictly for cap reasons um Mm -hmm. getting back to like kind of that discussion with like Ruzicka is almost the 2c now because yeah like you said I thought the Backlund Coleman Lewis line has been a really good shutdown line for the team like they immediately threw them into tough games against like McDavid McKinnon like I thought they did a pretty good job for the most part shutting those guys down and if that's kind of your third line, like you said, then Rizicka becomes the 2C. And 
I, I just I'm torn on it because I would like to see Regis stay there to continue his development. But at the same time, when your team like the Flames, that's like this is their all in year. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to justify like waiting and seeing with a young guy. It's like you might just want to use the assets to bring in like a bona fide middle six, if not top six center, just to kind of round things off. Because at the end of the day, this is a team that kind of has to go for it this year. We've all talked about all the contracts coming up, just the way everything sits. You might not get another year like this. So I think we could very well see a deal happen. But like like Sutter said, Ruzichka is the kind of player that if he's not going to be in your top nine, like he's better served in Stockton, which is a nice breath of fresh air after we saw them kind of sewer prospects over the years, putting them on the fourth line when they made the NHL and then wondering why they weren't scoring like three goals a game. So, yeah, I, I'm i kind of I'm I'm not opposed to keeping Ruzichka there, but like. I'm, I would be totally on board if they made a trade at this point, too. I think, though, if you do make that trade, I think you consider sending Ruzichka back. To, it's, it's such a tough spot with Ruzichka, especially because he's really shown his last kind of like 40, 50 games in Stockton that he's probably quite like quite a bit too good for the AHL. But at the NHL level, like if this was a like a middling seventh or eighth in the West Flames team, I think you could stomach keeping him up. But like if you're a team that's going for it this year, they're a top two team right now, like. I, I'm really okay with sending him down, letting him make a run with the league leading heat there, and then coming back maybe next year and just definitely having a top nine role. So I don't know. I'm torn because I like Ruzicka so much, and I'm kind of going against how I feel about it. But it just feels like to round out this team better, they do need that one more kind of piece, whether that's a center or a wing. They probably can't do both. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm torn. I, I keep I'm arguing with myself almost on this. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree with you because, like, I mean, it happened kind of in 2018, 19, but like these seasons just don't come along every single year. And then, like, the NHL just proves time and time again, like, you have to seize your chances when you have it. And I mean, really, it's probably fair to say there's no greater time for the Flames to do this with. I mean, you don't have to worry about Goudreau playing the playoffs. Like, he signed through that. Like, beyond that is another story. But, I really like Ruzich. I think he's going to be a really good NHLer, but I think I'm with you. Like, if you have the opportunity to add a center, you're probably doing that. And, like, if Monaghan somehow goes the other way, like, Ruzich is not really going to be suited as a 4C. Like, he, he's not really fit to that role. So if he's not playing, um, yeah, with, with um, Manjapani to Foley in that kind of role, like, yeah, he's just not going to be on this team. Um so yeah, I guess that kind of brings us to like another little discussion is like if we're talking about bringing in a 2C or a 3C or, you know, maybe some other positions like the, the Flames kind of have to um, bet against their own future now and have to decide what they're willing to give up. So like um, I think we both have some thoughts. I'm curious to hear what you'd be kind of willing to give up this coming uh, trade deadline. Well, yeah, because I've been kind of looking at the Flames' assets, and obviously they kind of have like that upper class of their prospects, like the former first-round picks, Peltier, Coronado, Zeri. They've got next year's first because they already sent this year's first to Montreal. Like that and Dustin Wolf, like those five, I would say are probably the Flames' like big swing prospect type pieces. Um, I think off the NHL roster, like players that might be available, I think Dylan Dubé is not totally safe with his job here i just don't think we've seen a fit with him this year and i know sutter's not the or it doesn't seem like at least that sutter's the biggest fan of him so like those kind of strike me as the pieces that like you would probably at least have to send one of them back if you're making that big swing i'm kind of just looking at like the trade bait board in terms of centers that are available like Mm -hmm. i know one name we've kind of thrown out a, a lot in at least in this market is thomas hurdle and he's apparently very close to signing with the sharks now so that's off the board. And also, like, I don't know what the Sharks are doing on a side note, like signing guys to eight year extensions when you're supposed to be starting a rebuild. Like, that's kind of how they got here. But uh, anyways, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at like you got like obviously like Giroux. I, I think that's a bit of a pipe dream at this point. Like, I would love to see it, but it just seems like between him having the no movement clause, um, other teams probably making bigger plays for him that can give up a bit more in terms of prospects like. That's a little out there. I think Hal Yarncrook, I think he's still the name that just seems like it, he to me, he seems like the kind of fit we saw with uh Tyler Toffoli. Like it just seems like that obvious fit, like a, a right-handed shot that can play center or the wing, depending on what the flames decide to do. But really, once you get past him, like you got like Andrew Kopp kind of down the list, like JT Miller's like a next year kind of guy. Like he's probably not going anywhere. Like 
there's not a huge crop of centers in this year's uh on this year's like kind of trade bait list. So anyways, yeah, getting back to like the pieces they're willing to give up, like I don't know. I'm I have a hard time dipping into the top prospect bucket at the deadline, just especially if it's for a rental. Like unless you're getting someone with term, it just it feels hard to give up unless you're getting like a bona fide top six forward. And like I said, outside of Giroux, I don't think that piece is really out there anymore. Um I I, I kind of figured if they were going to trade one, it would have been in the Toffoli deal. And, like, I thought that was a nice piece of work to, like, basically give up a late first and Heinemann, who's a questionable prospect. Like, he, he's definitely been, like, that B tier where you got guys like uh, Connor Mackey, like, Yusuf Valimaki, Emilio Peterson, like, that kind of mm-hmm. range. But in terms of, like, the top pieces, I think you just have to... I don't I I'm okay with giving up one because at the end of the day it's an all-in year like you, you kind of have to go for it and like you, they have enough depth like I said like those are five pieces I think at most one of them would move in a trade and mm-hmm. then you've got still four other good pieces and like six or seven solid like secondary assets so like I I think I'm okay with moving one but like it, you've got to be making sure you're getting just like a good good piece and we've seen before the flames have held off on those kinds of moves so I think I could live if they didn't do much besides like, I, I still think yarn crooks, the obvious answer, but, and then you maybe move one of those B assets for him in like one of the seconds or something. But I I don't know. I can live with moving a top piece, but I'm not like just based on who's available. It doesn't seem like there's a great fit to move one of those guys to bring someone in. Yeah. And like, even if they're bringing somebody with term, like, like as we alluded to, like there's a big, cap decision this summer with you know four major guys needing new contracts and you know they've already made the decision to add to Foley to their books at four million which I mean is a steal of a deal with how he's playing like no complaints there but it really feels like if they're gonna add another big piece whether it's you know unlikely that it's a rental and it, and it be a big piece going back but if they add someone with term like it's hard to believe that they don't find a way to clear like a Sean Monahan off the books just to give themselves some flexibility because he's just it's just too much money in your forward core at a certain point and yeah I personally when it comes to kind of these blue chip prospects that we're talking about like the fact that the Flames have kind of stocked their cupboards with like three really good forwards at this point in Zary, Pelche and uh, Coronado like giving up one doesn't make it as devastating as maybe like a few years past where the flames kind of have had one really good prospect at a time as they've traded first round picks here and there over the past couple of years. And I really think that these upcoming 2023 first round picks and that draft in general is really going to carry a premium with, I mean, arguably two generational talents um, in this in the discussion for that one so just just having a shot in the lottery whether the team's a lottery pick or not will definitely put a premium on those draft picks so we'll we'll see if anybody's willing to dip into their chests and give those away but you're right like there's not a lot of center depth I wonder if I mean I, I haven't seen anything this is just off the top of my head but with how much Vegas is struggling and maybe you know again like he genuinely could be hurt I'd be probably is but if you know there's a way they can bring Mark Stone back you wonder if they'd clear out like a William Carlson or something that the Flames could be on own but you're right like Hurdle being locked up in San Jose makes no sense like they let Pavelski walk like and we see how well he's played with Dallas. Like, it seems like they're committing to a rebuild, letting someone like that go. But then they've just signed, you know, Burns, Carlson, likely hurdle to these massive extensions. It's just they're they're going to be trapped in limbo. But, I mean, if they can add a 2C, the thing is, is or Treleving, sorry, finds a way to kind of find these guys for trade that necessarily you know, you don't hear a lot of rumblings about, I know it was a draft deadline trade or sorry, draft day trade, but like Lindholm and Hannafin weren't massively out there in uh, trade talks before Trelevin got them. They, it was kind of an out of the blue trade to an extent. So, you know, you never know who he's looking at. Um, when it comes to selling the future, like, like I said before, like these years just don't come along and, if you, you know, the Flames kind of famously at this point won their only Stanley Cup by giving up one of the best goal scorers in Stanley Cup history to bring two kind of side pieces aboard, which arguably helped in a good 
good backup goaltender in Rick Walmsley and a pretty good defenseman in uh, Rob Ramage. So, I mean, sometimes that's the cost of winning. And as somebody who's seen very little success from this team in his lifetime and, you know, you, you look at Leafs fans and it just, it's a scary thing to think <laughs> your team can go that long without success. So, you know, if that's the cost to bring somebody aboard that makes a difference, like at this point, I, I'm fine with them giving up arguably anything at this point for the right deal. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I think you brought up an interesting point with like the 2023 pick. I think it's it's going to be an interesting how would teams would like value that Flames pick, for example, because obviously like this year's pick, it was pretty obvious when it was dealt that it's going to be like a late mid, probably mid to late. 20 20s depending on where they end up in the playoffs pick so Mm -hmm. i'm just looking at it now and it's kind of like if you're a team that's maybe selling this year or selling a guy with term like 2023 it's johnny gaudreau gonna be a flame like (laughs) how are they gonna kind of work all that together because he's kind of been the straw that or the the straw that stirs the drink there work on my uh analogies (laughs) but yeah he's kind of been like that piece if if there's a legitimate chance he's not a a flame next year does that suddenly become a team again that's back kind of in the wild card bubble and then who knows like we saw at that Hamnick deal suddenly that becomes Noah Dobson who's been a absolute stud for the Islanders and that still hurts all these years <laughs> later so like where do you it's kind of like where do you put that value but then you kind of just like look around the rest of the the league and there's kind of it, it is different this year in that we kind of have a lot of teams that are definitely out of the playoffs like especially in the east there's like an eight and eight cutoff that's just like mm. right there and in the west i would say really once you get out of that top eight which like i'm i'm including dallas in the top eight and uh vegas on the outside right now even though they're not quite there points wise like yeah. there's maybe like vegas vancouver maybe winnipeg but that, other than that that there's five other teams that are like no question out of the playoffs there so i, I really think we're just going to see a a buyer's market i think like we saw today frank vetrano went for a fourth round pick like that's a player i mm-hmm. would have imagined would have picked up at least a third most years and that was even just to a team also in the playoffs like it was kind of weird to see two kind of eastern contenders trading with players or a player with each other but yeah i think it's just going to be a really uh i don't want to say interesting deadlines i feel like people use like the interesting term too much when describing <laughs> things that they don't know what's going to happen i just think the flames are in that position, like you said, where they maybe have to give up a, a player with higher long-term potential just to round out that core now. And w- when you got your chance, when you got your chance to win, because like I said, there might not be Gaudreau next year. Kachuk might be one more year if he accepts mm-hmm. his qualifying offer and then he's gone. You're never going to have a guy with Manjapani's value on a contract like his or Shillington. Who knows how long Sutter's sticking around? Like, it kind of felt like when he signed his original deal, which was three years, this is the second one. Like maybe he just sees out that contract. Like how long do you have Markstrom being this elite? Like this mm-hmm. was kind of a, does this end up being the one year where he was elite in his deal? Like after last year with his struggles, like it, it, there's just too much right now going their way with also a division that's pretty weak. Like I don't, Nashville kind of scares me as a wild card team, but like none of the other Pacific teams scare me. Like the flames do have a pretty clear path to the Western conference finals. If they, just play their game. They play the Sutter way. So I, I think you really just have to consider pushing anything and everything on the table if you need that one more piece. But I don't know. They got to where they were also by not really adding outside to Foley, which I know was a big add. But like they've got the team there now to just absolutely run through if they need to as well. So I, I don't know. It's just I don't know. We also always overvalue every fan base overvalues their own prospects too. like it's. It's a deadline that I think we're going to kind of see a lot about what the Flames are willing to do. Like, it seems like Colorado's kind of loading up for that another big swing. Like, they got Josh Manson yesterday, and then they uh, were a couple days ago, and then they made that Tyson Joe trade to free up some calf space. So, man, if they get Giroux or someone, that just they, they become a terrifying team even more so. So, I guess that's the other question. Is if you have McKinnon and Giroux as their two centers in uh, Colorado, and then you have to go... I guess Lindholm and like you're saying, Ruzicka were back, and like that's where you see that gap immediately open up, and the Flames would probably have to fight to fill that. So, um, I guess one thing we want to maybe just get into in general is just like how impressed have you been with the Stockton Heat this year? Some of those prospects you're mentioning, like they look like they're really ready to go on a big run here. They're tops in the uh, AHL right now on points percentage. So, what's kind of surprised you, or what's kind of and what kind of hasn't surprised you about the team this year? 
Yeah, like honestly, like we talked about it a little bit before the Heat kind of have a good start to the year every year. They've they've had some prospects get off to really good starts and then as the seasons go on, they just they fall apart a lot of years. I think they've only made the playoffs once or twice in the last or in their entire time in Stockton, honestly. And I mean, they play a weird schedule. They do a lot of traveling in the Pacific Division, but this year it's just all come together. They've they haven't had a lot of roster turnover from last year, which honestly they 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 usually have that a lot of years. And I found that um, Brad Pascal and Brad Chelving this season brought a lot of older depth guys back that honestly they usually let walk in seasons past. Like we saw Byron Fraze come back, who's of course the captain of the Heat and has made a few call ups or made a few trips up to the Flames. Justin Kirkland is an older prospect that they re-signed, brought back. Luke Philp is a U of A student that they signed out of, um, uh, yeah, sorry, the U of A. And he, he came back and he's having another good season. And then, of course, we've seen Matthew Phillips have his best AHL year to date. He's well over a point per game. He's stayed healthy, most importantly. Jacob Pelche is just having a ridiculous point per game rookie season, which just, you know, the AHL is the second or third best league in the world. And to do that as a rookie in any situation is awesome. Maybe a little bit on the negative side. I I had a lot of hope for Connor Zary this year. He looked really phenomenal in his, uh, I think it was a nine game stint with the heat last year. I think he had seven points and he's just, he's struggled a little bit this year. He's fallen down the lineup. The Heat are very much like the Flames. Like, they're kind of a powerhouse team, and it's not as easy to crack the roster as it's been the past couple of years. So he's played maybe more of a re- reduced role than he'd be used to. So, you know, you look at his point totals, he's got five goals and 16 points in 37 games, which, you know, it's not great considering he's also a rookie, but he, he's, a you know, a draft year younger than Pelletier and – you know, we'll see how he plays next year. Another maybe slight disappointment is I really wanted to see Yusuf Valamaki go down to the AHL and really like he's been a point per game player there before. And I was really hoping he would go down and, you know, kind of make it hard to keep him down there. But injuries and I mean, kind of the play that's plagued him in Calgary has followed him there. And he's just kind of hovering around half a point per game, which is a little disappointing. Yeah, uh, in terms of kind of a new observation, um, Johannes or Johan Shinval, who I was really excited about the Flames bringing aboard. He had actually a pretty interesting preseason with the Flames. He was hurt for a long time, and he's been in 12 games now and has seven assists. And he's just really an offensive generating defenseman from the blue line and um, finally made it onto the roster. He's been really good. Another rookie defenseman. Ilya Solovyov, who I think was, was he a seventh rounder? Yeah, seventh round. I think he, I think he was like an overage seventh rounder too. I think he, and I think didn't he, I believe he played in the KHL last year too. So he's, he did got a little taste of everything going with him. Yeah, he's come over and looked pretty good, honestly. He's, you know, he's not a point producer by any means, but he's looked really solid. Uh, I mean, Dimitri Zavgorodny, I think, broke all our hearts. He looked so good in junior. Looks like such another depth uh, steal, but just can't seem to find his game in the AHL. They rescued him from Russia shortly before everything kicked off, and he's joined the Heat. But, yeah, it's not looking too good for him at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it's seventh-round picks. Sort of sixth and seventh-round picks. They don't always work out. It's But it, it's nice to see, like, that's one thing I have liked about the Bradtree living tenure is that they take swings on guys with high skill levels, but maybe not other pieces to their game. And we saw it work with Manjapani. We've seen guys like Phillips have a shot at it. Um, yeah, I think it's it's too bad. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he's a bit of a late bloomer. Maybe he has a better season next year. But yeah, it just hasn't been there since he got to Stockton. Um, I think kind of getting into all this is that it's interesting that Stockton this year has become more of a focus on like being a good team like you said bringing back some veterans in past years they've been very development focused and that's paid off with a lot of good players who are now applying their trade with the flames but to see them kind of go on this run it is nice i'm sure if you're a local stockton fan it's probably nice to see the team doing really well as on top of all that i think one thing that's really interesting to me is just how well or how good dustin wolf has looked and this is something 
I continue to bring up like in articles on podcasts, wherever I can on Twitter. Um, just what, like, what, what do you think the plan has to be now for Dustin Wolf going forward? Because like, I, I felt like coming into the season, like, okay, he'll get a couple of years in the NHL, he'll really kind of get settled into pro hockey. But then, you look at him now, like twenty six four and three, he's leading the AHL in save percentage. Funny enough, he doesn't have a shutout yet, despite all these games where he held a team to like one goal or two or less than two goals. Usually one goal, like. That's just kind of a quirky stat, but like some might chalk it up to, yeah, the Heat are a good team, but you kind of look at like Adam Werner. He's, I think he's somewhere around like nine and six and like kind of a middling save percentage. So like, it's, it's not just the fact that the Heat are good. Like Wolf is a big reason why the Heat are good. So like, where do you see his kind of path going? Like, obviously he'll get the rest of this year to go on a run, but like, do you think he unseats Dan Fladar as the backup by next year? Or like, where do you go with that? Yeah, like goaltender development is probably one of the scariest things in hockey, I assume. Like there's just no definitive way to treat your goalies. I mean, like we've seen lots of goalies come in young and hot and then really cool off. I mean, Carter Hart is probably the best example of that currently. He had a phenomenal rookie season, looked really good in a second season. And he, along with the Flyers, have really kind of fallen apart these last couple of years. Um, there's lots of other good goalies in the NHL, but you're right. Like the Flames have not only an elite starting goaltender, but a really promising, arguably, you know, younger than most goalie 24 year old. And Dan Vladar is their backup, who's cost controlled for another year past this one. So, you know, there's always the worry that you maybe leave somebody too long in the AHL, but goalies have shown that kind of their peak age is 20, 24 to 26. Like, Igor Shosturkin and Ilya Sorokin have come over to the NHL in just the past two or, two or three years, and they were both 2014 draft picks. Like, any other position making your debut, like, that's bust territory. But both those guys have just, I mean, arguably they've played really good professional hockey overseas, but, you know, the NHL is unlike any other league. So to see them come over at that age and um, translate seamlessly is really interesting. The other thing about Wolf, though, of course, is his size. And, I mean, he's never going to be able to do anything about that. But, like we said, the AHL is a phenomenal league. And to put up the stats he has as, you know, not only an undersized guy, but as a really, you know, young rookie at one of the youngest goaltenders in the AHL currently is really superb to see. And, like, yeah, like you can try to qualify, like, his success to how good the Heat have been. But if you look at Adam Warner's stats, like, you know, Adam Warner seen NHL action and he's put up very, very pedestrian stats behind the heat. So, I mean, you look, you, we've seen Wolf's career. He puts these numbers up wherever he goes and it's just nothing seems to phase him. I'm not too familiar with his career path, but I feel like UC Soros is a guy we like probably should really start looking at in comparison, like not only size wise, but they really do play the same game to, to stay that, um, phenomenal in net and put up those stats like you have to play just the most structured goaltending game and UC Soros has become an elite NHL goaltender by playing you know arguably some of the most structured um, goaltending at that position so I'm not honestly sure what age he broke in but it, I can, it's interesting I can run through all that yeah, once you're we'll ready but um <laughs> I was just saying, I was kind of looking up like Wolf compared to obviously like Carter Hart is like the one comparable where you kind of just look at because like they both went through Everett together or like were yeah. together for a few years. They were both just dominant there um, on Hart's end. Like he uh, he went into the AHL in 2018, 2019. So that would have been his third season after being drafted. And he only played 18 games there, he had a 902 save percentage, 9-8-1 record, then immediately went to Philly that same year and 16 13 one in philly 9 17 so he actually jumped up when going to the nhl which i feel like is kind of a crazy development path there um but yeah no saros is an interesting piece or an interesting player to look at like like you said the size thing between the two is very similar um saros was drafted in the fourth round in 2013 he played two years after that in the Finnish league had very good numbers in 928 and 929 those two years um, after that, his third year, he went to the uh, M- Milwaukee Admirals in the AHL, like right there, 29 and 8, 920 save percentage. Like that's that's pretty similar to Wolf when you kind of look at like yeah. Wolf's in his, I think, third year after being drafted right now. And same thing, just the transition to the AHL dominant there. Um, 
that next season after that's when he start he had a 934 in the AHL and then immediately came into the NHL had a 923 there and then really hasn't looked back in his career and I still think is a very underrated goalie when you look around the league he maybe just didn't have the starts or Pecorine kept kind of like the limelight in Nashville but man like UC Saros has been a very good goalie pretty much right from when he broke into the NHL in 2016-17 I think the league's only really starting to find out about him in the last couple years but yeah no I think that's a fantastic comparable you brought up like I'm just kind of looking at his numbers like his progression he had like two to three years kind of in that backup role at the NHL level behind Rene like it almost seems like a natural fit to throw a wolf behind Markstrom for a couple of years, let Markstrom kind of teach him the ropes and uh, hopefully get, have Markstrom continue the, the elite level for a few mm-hmm. more years. And I mean, after that, like, I think that's the path. If you're a Flames fan, you got to hope for, I know people again, harp on the size, like, Oh, the next level is going to be the one that gets him or like the next big moment, but nothing seems to phase him right now. And I, I, I don't know, like as much as I've liked Vladar this year, like if you can get, a better pick than what you traded him for this like off season. Like, I don't think it's a stretch to get a second for him at this point. Like I really think you have to consider then maybe bring in Wolf and like a fringe goalie that can be a backup to the NHL if you need it or a, a starter in Stockton next year. Like that, that just seems probably like the way they're going to want to go because you just can't ignore how good Wolf's been. And when, especially when you look at somebody like Saros and how they have the same kind of path right now. Yeah. Like you, th- I think you threw it on Twitter. Like, the Flames got Vladar for a third, and it's like not without reason to say like they could get a second for him. Like that's typically what the the price for a backup goaltender who's maybe ready to start. We saw Cam Talbot go for that to the Oilers. Um, fuck, I've had another one a couple of seconds ago. I forgot it. Uh, Grubauer to the Avalanche, I think, went for a, a couple seconds. So like you can definitely get a nice package for a goaltender. The goaltender market. For some teams out here, I mean, we've heard the Leafs and the Oilers, you know, discuss this ad nauseum for weeks now. But, you know, why is Jonas Corposalo not moved? Like, why have these goalies that are Im- like improvements on teams that don't arguably need them? Why has there been no movement? It's it's a very bizarre market. So it's tough. I would, I would agree with you. Like, if you go by the Soros comparisons and a lot of other goalies, like you would assume next season, Wolf's maybe getting into some games here and there by way of injury or by merit and then you know the year after that potentially full-time backup if that's your plan to keep him because on the other side you never know what a goalie's going to be and lots and lots of goalies have put up good ahl numbers and never been good in the nhl so do you like it's it's as hard as it is to say as much as we all have wolf and what could be like selling at his absolute peak right now if that came to it like you would you could include him as a blue chip prospect in any trade and keep three really good forwards in your organization yeah that's god i i hate the idea of trading wolf <laughs> just from like an emotional perspective but like you're absolutely right there are there have been many a goalie that have like you said, just dominate down the AHL. Like you look at some of these guys every year who kind of like lead the AHL and in the stat or statistical categories and they come up to the NHL and they just get absolutely throttled and you never hear from them again. Like even just like a, a kind of an example I'm looking at this year is like the Devils had a Kira Schmid who's also a um, kind of late round pick that went to the AHL and just absolutely lit it up. Like him and Wolf were neck and neck most of the year. He's at like a 922, 18, 4, and 3. But then he goes to the Devils who admittedly are not a good NHL team to be fair and he's just been absolutely lit up there so it's one of those things where like you also maybe want to move him before he makes his NHL debut if you're going to do it because like you don't know how he's going to react at that level maybe his value will go down there so I don't I I really don't want to trade Dustin Wolf like again just because it would hurt my heart but in terms of like a blue chip goalie prospect like I think you'd have a tough time finding like a higher end goalie prospect outside the NHL right now than Dustin Wolf so I, I'm just yeah. No, I, I like Wolf too much. I would be okay making him the backup next year. I think you could flip Vladar somewhere. Like, I think maybe that's why they've given him a lot of tough games with try to show teams like, look, he's still pretty good against good teams. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I overrate their ability to play like 4D chess on the Flames. Maybe it's just Sutter like <laughs> trying to throw a rookie under the bus. I don't know, but I. I would be okay with either two. It's nice with Wolf and Vladar that they're both going to be cheap backups, regardless of who ends up being the backup next year. Like that they're going to need every dollar they can. So I don't know. I'm just, I, I, it's so fun. Like every time you watch, like you, you're just following on Twitter, like the heater playing or you happen to catch a game and like 
Dustin Wolf's just making all these ridiculous saves. They're winning like three one on a regular basis with him. Um, yeah, I, I I'm pretty excited about him, and I'm pretty sure that's echoed by a lot of people. Yeah, and the thing is, I'm definitely a little hardened towards goalies because, like, I, I make lots of jokes about it on the podcast, but. You know, following John Gillies through college and through those first couple of years in Stockton, combined with the fact that he's six foot six, like in my mind, I couldn't see how he wasn't going to be the goalie of the future. And it just everything pointed that direction. And then honestly, in the span of a couple months when he hurt his hip and was out and never fully recovered, like that was kind of the end of his elite prospect status. You just never know with goalies. They terrify me outright. But you're right, like Wolf is such a fun guy to follow. It really touches you how guys like him and Ruzichka really kind of buy into that Sutter mentality. Every time Ruzichka talks at the podium, you can tell like he's he's practically just a puppet for Sutter. Like you just bought in totally. And I, I just get the feeling from Wolf that he's just such a student of the game. He's such a serious guy and it just really shows in how he plays. He just he makes so few mistakes. I don't know why you're slandering John Gillies. He's going to be starting at the Saddle Dome today, it looks like. Isn't that oh, what we were all waiting for all these years? Like, John Gillies at the Saddle Dome? So, in a big game that has playoff implications for one of the teams, definitely not. And the yeah. Flames can add uh, Jankowski back on waivers as well. It's all coming together. Yeah, it's amazing how some of these pieces that we had all that hope for uh, turned out not being great from the Jay Feaster era. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still waiting for Jankowski to become that, uh, what was it, the best player that's going to come out of the 2012 draft class? Uh, and, like, I saw a thread, a Twitter thread the other day where Jankowski got put on waivers and someone was, like, pulled up his AHL stats and was saying, like, they, they can't believe he ever looked good. And it's like, man, like, there was days where, like, Jankowski came to the NHL and, like, was scoring at, like, an insane rate. It's like, oh, my God, like, he was right. Like, this this guy's going to be awesome from this draft. Then he came to the Flames and, I mean, 17 goals as a rookie is nothing to sneeze at. And only he and Sam Bennett have had four goal games in my somewhat recent memory <laughs> i mean all the signs look good for jankowski and yeah and again in the span of like a really poor 18 19 season where pretty much every flame and career highs was over and yeah look where look where they all are now yeah it's i just remember that jankowski hype train like the four <laughs> goals i think i think it was in the final game of the season against vegas yeah. and that was his like kind of rookie year. It's like, oh, he had 17 this year, man. He's going to take that next step next, which he kind of did. He got 32 points yeah. the next year, which was up a little bit. But just like the 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 running Jankowski hype train after a pretty bad season where they didn't have a first round pick, they're going to fire their coach. Like it gave us hope. And then, yeah, it just completely went off the rails. Seven points in 2019-20. <laughs> went to oh. Pittsburgh. Couldn't crack Buffalo this year. I think that's kind of when it's like a <laughs> sign that like it's probably time. So... Oh, I, yes. I still hope he has a career, but man, like I don't, just Jay Feaster didn't have to set himself up for it with that quote, like best player of the class. Like, you <laughs> see, we're excited about him. He might be a little unknown. Like that just. And, like, I, they I drafted him out of high school too. Like it was just, it was destined for failure from the start. But speaking of Buffalo, like do we have to start considering Craig Anderson to be like the second best drafted flames goaltender of all time? It's 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 a legitimate discussion. Like I don't know. I, I kind of watching the All Star game. It's like it's crazy to think, or not the All Star, the Heritage Classic, the other yeah. game. Like it's crazy to think like <laughs> that he was a Flames draft pick. Like wasn't it like in the late nineties that he was drafted too? Like he he's been around a while. And I think it was. I think he was taken by the Flames in two thousand and then redrafted in two thousand one by the Blackhawks or something. That sounds right. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 a very <laughs> low bar for uh, Mister Wolf right yeah. now. <laughs> Maybe that's why we're all so excited, just because we never had that like goalie that quite has gone the way he has, at least in recent years. I, was, I remember pulling up some goalie stats and just specifically like goalies drafted by the Flames a while ago, and like like Yoni Ortio is like genuinely in that like best like one of the best goaltenders just because he played games. Like it's insane how low the bar is, and I mean Wolf, we've been hurt so much. Like <laughs> no matter how it goes, it. There's there's no good outcome basically. Yeah, that's another name. Gosh, they're just like hitting all the classics. Like Yoni Ortio again. Like that that fourteen fifteen season where he came in, it wasn't bad for a little while there, and then like <sighs> oh, and then the three headed monster in twenty fifteen sixteen. Like 
I don't know. I'm shocked when you bring three goalies in on a roster that things really work out for none of them. Then he's just been all over the place. I think he's in the KHL this year being average. So like, God, yeah, we're just hitting all the classics today on picks that <laughs> didn't work out in the mid two thousand, mid to late, I guess, 2000s, early 2010s. Like, I don't, looking back, it's not a shock that this team had to rebuild after basically busting for like five years of the draft minus Johnny Gaudreau and yeah. I guess you could say Michael Backlund. Yeah, no kidding. Especially like all the draft picks they like almost had the the Tyler Watherspoons, the uh, the Sven Berchies. It's it's a, it's a, it was a sad time, but for all the people calling for you know Brad's head every time a trade doesn't get made, like go look at how bad Flames decision making was in those days, and you kind of begin to appreciate the spot the Flames are in now. Yeah, it just. I remember it was, I think it was the late 2000s where it was like they were trading second round picks like candy every year for like no reason in some of these trades. And when they did draft guys, it wasn't, it was just not the right choice. Um, I, I still wish Brad Living got a redo on the uh, 2014 draft, like where he had that extra second to use it on Hunter Smith when there's oh, other guys there. Um, I would have also wished. Mason McDonald. Because like ever since that draft, the scouting crew and him have just been pretty good at hitting like some really good names like i that's the two things i wish i wish he had control in the 2013 draft when they had three firsts and then they i wish he had control or like had a chance to redo that 2014 draft because they figured it out shortly after that but man 2014 like it it is kind of i find like another interesting story that like they pretty much busted their 2013 and 2014 draft classes which were the first two in the like in the rebuild like usually you see them that's where you get the core pieces and like even Sean Monahan at this point, like <laughs> he, he he was good for a while. He helped get things off the ground, but like we're pretty close to coming to a point where pretty much nothing came out of those two classes, but yet we're the team still managed to get somewhat relevant despite like they got nothing for the guys they sold off or they dra- I guess they drafted poorly with the picks they got for like the Ginla trade, the Bo Meester trade, but they still yeah. managed to be somewhat good all these years later. Like it's it, it definitely they made some bad decisions, but it also didn't help that they picked like two of the worst drafts to have a lot of high picks in. Like, like if you don't take Bennett, who are you taking fourth overall in 2014? Like those next couple were all just as bad. Like it was a bad draft in general. But yeah, taking like Mason McDonald over Thatcher Demko and Demko is like rated higher like it just it made no sense if you were going to take a goalie there why not take the consensus number one goalie and those yeah. drafts definitely hurt them for a long time i agree with you yeah totally like i'm with you on like the whole revisionist history on drafts like the 2014 draft like there was there was mock drafts that had sam ben- sam bennett going as high as number one like it was a pretty consensus top four with Ekblad, Reinhardt, Dreisaitl, and Bennett. Like, if the Flames, if the, even if the Flames took, like, Nylander, who, like, is probably the next player, like, Nylander and Ehlers went eighth and ninth to the Leafs and Jets, respectively. Like, if they reached for those guys, there would have been protests in the streets at the time. So, like, I kind of hate that revisionist yeah. history. It just sucks it didn't work out. And, and I'm like, happy to see I, Bennett I, doing better, but, like... I what, still what are you take gonna do? Bennett over Vertanen, who else? Dal yeah. Cole. Like it was the f- five, six, seven picks were just brutal. Like it was, it was almost lucky to get a guy they could eventually flip for two f- second round picks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how it's, it's become really funny how um, teams have kind of loaded up on top guys from the same drafts, like Reinhardt, Ekblad, or both on Florida now. Winnipeg and Columbus have each had Line A and Dubois. Oh, there's another one. I can't well, remember. Well, it's the but Flames it's... in 2013, except it was bad yeah. players they loaded up on. Yeah. I think, it, I think what did we get? I thought we got like seven or eight first-round yes, picks. They're up to seven with Zadorov now. Jeez. And just like five of them aren't good, but just oh, yeah. that's just the class he had to go for. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, um, I don't know, I've... This is kind of off our Flames related topics, but man, watching Buffalo the last like I've watched more of their games the last like week or so, like they get a couple pieces. They might be a playoff team next season. Like against Vegas, they looked really like Krebs is looking really good. Tuck's looking like a good fit there. Like I know they're still got a ways to go, but they'll have some cap space this summer. If they get a goalie, man, like I wouldn't be shocked to see them at least in contention next year. And I know this is totally kind of just out of the blue from what we were talking about, but you mentioned Craig Anderson. That got my uh, my head spinning on Buffalo a little bit. So 
Yeah, I know, I, I, I'm just impressed by them so far. Uh, I like how they're handling Lucan and I like how they're kind of keeping him away from another, you know, not very good team and maybe saving him because he could very well be their goalie. That You're right. Like, I take back a lot of what I said about Peyton Krebs. He's looked a lot different in Buffalo than he has in Vegas. Alex Tuck seems to really enjoy being home. Like, if they add a couple defensemen, they got away from Rasmus Ristolainen, which was a huge thing. Like, Rasmus Dahlin is still an exceptional talent, and if they give him, like, the freedom to kind of play his game with some more solid guys around him, like, for I agree with you 100%, Buffalo is kind of a sneaky team. Mm-hmm. And then I think you just brought up Vegas. Like, this is also another topic I kind of wanted to get to. But, like, how close are we to them becoming, like, I don't even know if I want to say, like, the next, like, San Jose. But just, like, it seems like they're just a case of, like, dysfunction. Like, you hear all these guys who are always, like, because they always had to bring in, like, somebody new. And, they like, when they shipped out and hate Schmidt and there was all that, like, there's a lot of anger about that on the team. Like, I don't know. I feel like if they miss the playoffs, which is a very real possibility this year, they just seem like that team that's going to make like a bad trade this summer to try and change things up, even though like they had a ton of injuries and stuff this year. Like they're already t- about a million dollars over the cap next year. And I think that's like with not even close to a full roster either. Like, I don't know. Vegas just seems like they're ready for just like a, a total dysfunctional off season. I'm very here for it after like how they kind of just came into the league and were like the best team for probably the last like four years, I would say. Yeah, I can already smell the news articles, like the headlines that say like Vegas going the distance that first season was the worst thing that could have happened to them because they just perpetually chased that glory every season afterwards and kind of stepped on whoever they wanted to in the process. They've traded like a good majority of their high draft picks at this point. They've... You- you're right, like you mentioned Nate Schmidt, they've cut loose a lot of guys that signed contracts with them and were shipped off quickly. Like if Genny Dadanov is like signed a contract this last summer and he's already like probably gonna be like their number one option to send out of town. Like it's it's turning itself into a place where like the attraction of Vegas might become overshadowed by how you get treated in Vegas. Like just like go ask Marc Andre Fleury what he thinks of Vegas now. Yeah, I was gonna say just like chasing that glory. That's it's like a perfect metaphor for the city they play in. Just like step over <laughs> anyone to get what you need to get there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think God, flurry too. It's again, I, I'm kind of jumping here, but like as we kind of get close to the deadline here, and like there's teams looking for goalies. Like, how many teams do you think regret not finding room to add Mark Andre Flurry to their team last summer when he w- literally w- went for? absolutely nothing and now it sounds like colorado's asking for like a first and like a mid-level prospect at least for him like again my i i I like to harp on the oilers because it's the oilers but like man you spent i think it's about 7.5 million between keith and smith which are both contracts they added last summer like just add the seven for for flurry for nothing if you add flurry to that oilers team take away keith and add like any replacement defender i think they're easily a top three team in the Pacific this year, like with room to spare, if not top two. Yeah. I saw Mark Spector throw an article out today where he said the Oilers should trade Tyson Berry to Seattle for Carson Soucy. And like, just reading that, it's like, even the Oilers media is somehow like breathing the same toxic fumes as the management. Like that is just such a nonsensical decision. Like it's exactly in line with like bringing Keith aboard and signing. Like it's just something's going on in Edmonton where they just like, they got McDavid and like the voodoo of that is like perpetual stupidity when it comes to decision-making every other circumstance. Yeah. I, I I don't think I've ever, I'm ever more glad for like how like just down to earth and like realistic the Calgary media is here until I have to like kind of research like an Edmonton story or figure out what's going on up there. Like, yeah, I, I, I respect the hell out of the media down here just because it (laughs) doesn't, they're not just like the Edmonton media or at least a few of the guys in the Edmonton media that just carry the water for the team and have these same crazy thoughts about players who are playing pretty well, but they just want to throw them under the bus for whatever reason. Like, yep. But yeah, um, I don't know. I, I guess we've gone for a little while. Like, we didn't really plan this out. We're not a, ex- <laughs> we're not exactly like the most structured of podcasts. But uh, is there anything else you kind of want to talk about before I guess we wrap it up for the day? 
Yeah, no, I thought that's a good place to leave off. We got to probably save some stuff for next time. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's, this is what Gordy and I do. We just often like text and we'll text for like two hours, but just like random hockey stuff until like way too late at night, just because like, yeah. I, know, <laughs> I, I feel like we probably, out of our friends, we probably follow it closer than most of the other people. So we just have to get all this off our minds at some point. Um, but yeah, if I guess if you enjoyed it, we'll uh, hopefully come out with another one of these soon. I, we're still working on a better name, the GM at M and G podcast. It's uh, not the greatest, but we're going to have some fun with it. Um, we're, we're always down. If you guys want to send us some topics to talk about, um, we might do another thing here kind of as we get into the, the lead up to the deadline, maybe the deadline day itself. And uh, yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed. I uh, check out our writing at matchsticks and gasoline. We got a few other podcasts on the Apple podcast, Spotify podcast, and I think Google podcast. And yeah, feel free to check us out there and uh, I guess we'll talk to you guys next time.